This is my angel. This is Biggie. He's a 10 week old French Bulldog. And he is the love of my life. Ah, so it's been a very long time since I've done a YouTube video. Um, actually just, I don't know, YouTube's not really my thing. I, even when I made YouTube videos in college, I never like watched any YouTubers or kept up with people. I mean, I would subscribe to like, you know, obviously my sister, like people that like I knew or um, thought I would like get into, but I just I never did. I don't know, YouTube's just not really my thing. I just felt like this was appropriate, um, the appropriate platform to use when sharing this because I think so many people can, you know, watch it or find it if they're ever researching or looking up, um, you know, mental health journeys or, you know, if they're bipolar too. So I'm gonna actually take it back um, to the very, very beginning of um, kind of my story with mental health, like leading up to my diagnosis this is what this video is gonna be. I recently was diagnosed bipolar type two. There's two types of bipolar, bipolar type one and bipolar type two. It's kind of hard to say. So if you know me personally, um, if I've ever been around you, I am a very bubbly outgoing person. I've always been described as so. Um, I'm very vivacious. I love life. I've always been that way. Um, I'm a very extreme person, which would make sense with my diagnosis, you know, later on. Um, but I've always been that way. I'm either like super high and excited and ready to go about life, like living life on fire, or I'm really low. But when things hit the fan, they not only hit the fan, but the fan falls and the roof collapses and the house caves in and that's when I get low. <laughs> like my lows are low and you know, it's either triggered by something very small. Stress will set anyone off, but to someone who's bipolar, it, it literally feels like it's the end of the world. So being diagnosed and being able to navigate that and understand that it's not anything I'm doing wrong. It's just chemically my brain is just, it needs a little bit of help and that's okay. So taking my mental health journey from the top, um, this kind of whole thing started for me in college. Um, if you're familiar with me, I am, or excuse me, I was a collegiate gymnast um, and I suffered a very intense injury my junior year. I tore my Achilles and it offset me to stay out of the season for that year. Um, as an athlete, that was the first time I'd ever had an injury take me out of the season completely. Of course, that was not my first injury. Um, however, that was my first major injury with a major surgery and a year long recovery. Of course, any athlete, any person knows that when you go, you know, when you withstand something as traumatic as that, it's, it's going to take effect on you, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all the levels. I think what's interesting about my um, my story is that injury was actually not the ultimate trigger, I would say. Um, it wasn't until after the injury, after I was fully recovered is when things started kind of going south for me. Um, I actually was able to use my injury to kind of create um, a platform for positivity, for showing athletes and even more so myself and my teammates. Um, those just around me that, you know, life's what you make it. Um, it's, you know, life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you, you know, make the best of your crappy situations. And so that's exactly what I did. So I actually think I kind of became well known in the gymnastics community as myself um, through that injury. I think I was an example for, you know, athletes who were also going through um, injuries, even even mentally or emotionally, physically, whatever it was, um, I tried my best to be a leader in that aspect. But anyone who's as bubbly and energetic as myself, um, you know that it does take a lot out of you. Um, people are my passion. I got to learn that through my injury. I got to learn that um, I love to encourage people. I love to help people see their potential and believe in themselves. Um, I'm a gymnastics coach now, and so it's been a really cool mesh of taking my passion for people and my passion for the sport of gymnastics and putting those two together. But being so on fire um, with a big personality is, it's draining. It's very, very draining. And when you are pouring into others constantly and you don't, aren't pouring back into yourself, um, it, it, can, it can lead to an ugly path. I think that's where it all kind of started for me was after that junior season, the one that I missed, the one where I was a cheerleader for the season, you know, for my teammates, um, pouring into people, like just being the hype girl really. Um, and when season had ended and everything kind of subsided, I got to take a deep breath, but it was like there wasn't any oxygen for me to breathe. So that's when I kind of started getting into depression. I just remember, I, I remember calling my, my dad and my mom 
constantly just crying and crying and just telling him I feel so stuck. I feel like I have this fog, this mental fog. I feel like my thoughts are just on a treadmill and I cannot get off and it just won't stop. It felt like I was reading a book and I just could not turn the page. So I would just keep rereading the same page over and over and over and over again. It, it felt, I felt crazy, I felt crazy. But on the other side of that, so you have this one side of your head that is absolutely haywire. I mean, it does not stop. And you have the other half of your head that's saying, okay, I am very aware of what's going on over here, but I don't know how to make it stop. So you have this split mind battle war situation of the rational versus the irrational and they're constantly at war and it is exhausting. At the time I was diagnosed with depression. I started seeing a psychologist at my, um, at LSU. Um, did not take medication. Um, it was a personal choice. I wanted, I knew myself and I knew that there were some personal demons in my life, um, some, just some personal trauma that I needed to attack first. And I wanted to make sure that I was not jumping to medication first. I wanted that to be um, the end piece. I definitely wanted that to be a piece of the puzzle. I, I, piece of the puzzle, I'm sorry. I wanted to make sure I was attacking my symptoms first, making sure that I was doing everything I can, um, not just medicating and not taking care of it because medication can only do so much if I'm not also doing the work within. So without taking medication, the depression really didn't improve. I think it got better only because, I wouldn't even say better, I was just self-aware and I could pinpoint, at least I knew that, hey, there's an issue, you know, I'm not just crazy, I'm not just stuck, this isn't just who I am now, this isn't just what my life is, like there's a reason I am acting like this and feeling like X, Y, Z. So I think that in itself made me feel a little bit better knowing that there was something wrong. So going into my senior year, um, the depression was still very much there. Um, there were there were times where I was extremely, extremely low. I didn't want to get out of bed. And coming off of a year before where literally I would get up, be so excited about the day, be so excited to meet new people and talk to people because that was my, that was my goal when I was injured was to impact as many people as I could, was to be a smiling face regardless of what I was going through. I mean, I, I made it my, my mission to even walk into class, smile at people, compliment random strangers, um, because I knew that, I knew it made me feel good when I made other people feel good. Um, so coming off of a year where I was literally so on fire and so in love with life to not wanting to get out of bed, not being interested in anything that I used to love, um, it, it was, it was, it was hard. <laughs> and I think what's tricky is this, this is this is a hard topic to get into sometimes because I think as much as it as great as it is that mental health is becoming a more popular thing and we're talking about it and there is we're getting rid of the stigma. Um, I think a lot of people jump to the conclusion um, of you know saying oh I I have depression versus you can be depressed without having depression. You can be anxious without having anxiety. You know medically anyway. And so I think as an athlete, being a go-getter, being motivated, being a grinder, the kind of just naturally as that's who I am, um, I would still get up and I still go to practice. I would still make sure I was eating what I was supposed to be eating. I would, st I would still do everything I was supposed to do, but that fire and that passion and that love and lust for life was not there anymore. Lust was not the right word. I don't know what I was trying to say, but it wasn't lust. It was zest. The word, it was zest, that zest for life, yes. So senior year was a tough one. Um, gymnastics, least speaking, my career was incredible. Um, on paper, it was my best year without a doubt. I um, actually, what was really cool, I got a perfect 10 um, and I mean, yeah, that's, that's cool. But I think for me, the biggest thing was that I got a perfect 10 on the event that initially took me down with my Achilles. So that was a really, really um, bittersweet thing to do. For myself and end my career in the PMAC on senior night, um, it was kind of just, everything kind of felt like it came together. Moving on to graduation, I think anyone knows, whether you're an athlete or not, when you graduate college, when you come from any sort of big transition from this upscale, big environment to kind of shifting into normal life or like something a little way more low key, you lose yourself and you don't know who you are. And anyone out there, any young adult out there, anyone even going through like a job transition, Transitions are hard in general. So that in itself was a whole nother ball game. And I think that's when my depression shifted into anxiety. 
at the time I was not seeing a doctor. Um, I thought that, um, I, I didn't know what was anxiety. I thought it was just my depression and I thought I could manage it and I really couldn't. Um, every day was a battle. Every day I would wake up um, not wanting to go through the day, just wanting to get by, going through the motions. And I hated that. I hated that. Again, back to that part of myself where I was fighting to get through the day. I was fighting my, my negative thoughts and just my my negativity. It was just, I was so, I was so low. I was fighting that as well as like critiquing myself, saying like, you used to be this very passionate person and now you are like a no one. Now you have nothing to give. Like what's wrong with you? Just get over it, just suck it up. I thought I was just like not motivated. And I think that's what killed me the most is how critical I was of myself. I mean, of course I didn't know any better. I didn't know at the time that it was much, much greater of a deal than, you know, just anxiety or depression. And I'm not saying that by downsizing those two things because those are big deals, but um, not knowing I had a, a diagnosis that was more, um, I didn't know any better. So after graduation, I lived back at home for almost a year and then I moved to uh, my first new city, leaving home, getting my first big girl job, having my own bills, having um, living by myself um, in a new city, three weeks into my new job and COVID happens. So someone with a mental health issue being alone in a new city being isolated with her own thoughts this was not a good recipe <laughs> covid and the i like to call it the og lockdown like the original where literally the entire world was shut down was one of the hardest things i've ever gone through e even more so than an achilles tear when you can't escape your own brain it it feels, you feel like you're in an insane asylum. And I'll get into a little bit more um, what those thoughts look like um, and those red flags and what triggers look like, at least for me. Um, but I just kind of want to walk through my story first, just in case any of you are kind of going through the same thing. It, it's very interesting how subtle mental illness can be, how sneaky it is, how you're still able to function and get through your day. It's just, it's not a quality of life. And I think that was the biggest thing for me as I was in like denial for the longest time um, because I was still getting through my day. I was still working out. I was still doing all the things I would normally do. I just, it was like a robot. I had no emotions or feelings and I was constantly so tired. So in the middle of the OG lockdown, I was actually going through a breakup as well. <laughs> So I had like curveballs coming in from every direction, um, but I, you know, I was trying to t do the whole, you know, life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Um, and I, coming out on the other side, I was really, really proud of myself. Um, however, I mean, of course I got to a point where it was, I, it was really bad. I would go to sleep crying and I would wake up crying. I don't know if any of you have ever like woken up from a dream, like mid laugh or like mid tears, but I would wake up every day crying. Um, this is scary to say, but almost upset to be waking up. I didn't want to have to power through another day. I didn't want to have to hear my own thoughts again. I didn't want to, I didn't want to fight anymore. I was so tired of fighting and I'll never forget. Um, I was one day, I was getting ready for work. I was in my kitchen making breakfast and I, I could not stop crying. Um, like ugly crying, like sobbing, crying, like hyperventilating. I sit down at my counter and I'm looking at my breakfast, but my eyes are like totally fogged up with just tears. Um, and I just remember lifting up my head and I said, I am not okay. And I called my dad, because my dad um, has anxiety, so he just gets me on a different level. Called my dad, could barely talk. Um, he dropped everything he was doing and he drove up to meet me, which would be like an hour away, or two hours away, excuse me. No, three, sorry, I don't do directions. I drive to work. Um, while he's on his way up, um, I asked my my boss to come into the office and I had not stopped crying. And I was so thankful for masks because I didn't want the girls to see. I didn't want attention. I didn't want pity. I, I wasn't okay and I just needed help. I talked to my, my boss and he sent me home with his um, associate head coach. Um, and I just, it was nice to just have someone to talk to. We just got to hang out and talk and I got to breathe and not be alone. Um, and we just waited for my dad to show up. Um, by the time my dad had shown up, he had already had me enrolled in a therapy group. 
um, which was nice to have a community of people and then already had myself um, signed up with a psychiatrist. I think that that was the biggest, the biggest thing is I asked for help and I went through with it and I started medication and it was the most life changing thing I've ever experienced. I, I couldn't believe that it could do this much for me. I, I got that quality of life back that I forgot was possible. I thought that this was just who I am now, this depressed, um, unmotivated, sad, I felt pathetic um, person. This just is who I was now. I'm just gonna go through the motions every day because that's, you know, this is what being an adult is. I was, I was really convinced that this was just what it was now. Um, and I started medication and boy was I wrong. So I started on sertraline. Um, I originally started at 15 milligrams and I made my way up to, I'm now on 50. Um, I take that with a couple other things, but that's, you know, further on in the story. So the sertraline, which is also known as Zoloft, um, was a game changer. And lucky for me, that was the first medication we tried and it worked for me. Um, a lot of times there's kind of a trial and error situation, which sucks, especially when you're someone who's in a low, um, you want that medication, you want it to work immediately because there are some days where you're like, I don't know how I'm supposed to get through. The number, the number one thing that was a game changer for me was my energy levels. Before I started medication, I'd say probably the, the two months before I started, um, I felt so sick. I thought I thought I had, there were so many times I thought I had COVID. There were so many times I thought I had the flu or mono. I really thought I had mono. Um, I was so sick. I would have three to four cups of coffee a day and it did nothing for me. Um, I felt like a zombie. I felt tired. I felt nauseous. I just felt like someone was just dragging me through the day and I was like chained with weights. I just felt this heaviness to me. Um, and my medication gave me my life back and I felt like, I, I didn't even need a cup of coffee anymore. So I went from feeling really sick mentally and physically to essentially getting my life back. Um, and that was incredible. And it was awesome until it wasn't. So I started medication in 2020, um, 20, this like the summer, fall, like August of 2020. Um, and it was great up until March, March of 2021. I get these, I get all the years so confused. Like I get like 2019 and 2021 are all like one year to me. It's so confusing. In March of 2021, I don't know what happened, but something just, something just absolutely triggered me and I was so low. Um, I was having suicidal thoughts. I was um, extremely depressed. I, there were, there were days where I almost called in to work saying I can't come in today. So at the time in March, um, I, Again, it was that whole mindset of, I am so depressed, I don't wanna live, I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna do that, to, I have no reason to be feeling this way. At the time, I was in an incredible relationship. I had a job I loved, I worked with incredible people, I loved my family, I had great friends, like I had every reason to be happy and to be so excited about life, yet I did not wanna even be here. So that's when I talked with my doctor and you know, I assumed, okay, we're just gonna need to up my dosage, um, but I did think it was kind of odd that, you know, this level of medication um, was working and then all of a sudden it just isn't at all. Um, so that's when we kind of looked into my symptoms a little bit more. She was very taken back by the fact that um, I was triggered by essentially nothing um, and how aware I was of um, the lack thereof of trigger. Um, and how normal it was for me, how I just was like, oh, this happens sometimes, but this is just a really, like, I'm just really, really low. I've never been this low before. I never had suicidal thoughts up until that March. So we upped my medication, um, thinking that maybe that's just what it was, and it worked for a little bit until this last July. This is when I'm gonna kind of get into um, kind of my recent strand of months at leading into my diagnosis. Um, this past July, I was killing my summer. I was having so much fun. I was doing camps. I was going on vacation. I got to see my long distance boyfriend more. Like I, I had, a, I was having a great time um, until the suicide, suicidal thoughts returned. Um, and I was back to, I was even lower. I was even lower than I was in March. And I was really afraid of myself. I was, I didn't trust myself to drive. Um, I was really scared to be by myself. I didn't want to be in my own head. I was genuinely afraid you know those that that not feeling in your stomach when you like watch a scary movie or you're at a haunted house um that's what i felt just to be within myself 
And that scared me because I'd never felt like this before. So I reached out to my doctor again. And mind you, we met like every month, but um, important to keep up with those things. You don't just get cured once guys. You don't just take medication and all is good. Okay, you have to keep up with it. That's important. Consistency is so important in anything, but especially this. So long story short, talking to my doctor, um, explaining, you know, we're back to stage one. Um, she decided to diagnose me bipolar type two. And so we started on a mood stabilizer medication. I started um, on lithium bicarbonate, which um, I was nervous about because um, I know bipolar medication is very intense. It's very, the side effects can be pretty brutal. Um, and unfortunately for me, they were <laughs> very brutal. Um, a lot of vomiting, a lot of just GI issues, um, horrible migraines, tired. Um, I actually wasn't as drowsy and tired as I had seen in other people's stories. They said like their energy was really bad. Mine wasn't too bad. Um, but for me, it was more so the nausea was so, so bad. Um, it didn't matter if I ate or didn't eat. I was constantly nauseous. Um, but about a week into it, the side effects went away and I, I was in such a good place. Like I felt like me again. I felt like I had my life back and I just could not believe that, um, that this was that this was the diagnosis. And initially when I when she diagnosed me, it took me a very long time to be able to accept that. Um, it probably took me a few weeks to, to come to the terms of, okay, I'm bipolar and now let's do something about it. Um, at first I was very embarrassed. I was very ashamed. I felt guilty. I felt, um, I felt stupid. I felt like no one would get it. Um, I, cause I mean, I didn't know too much about bipolar and, and I barely knew anyone who was bipolar, but you know, when you think of someone who's bipolar, um, you think of Britney Spears shaving her head, or at least I do. And I know that's not the case. I did watch the Britney Spears, um, documentary, but you get what I'm saying. Um, I think of crazy people. I think of someone who needs to be in a straight jacket and in, in, in an insane asylum. I didn't want to tell anybody. I didn't want to talk about it. Um, I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. But at the same time, part of me was relieved. Part of me was like, this makes sense. My entire life, I have been a roller coaster of emotions. The littlest things set me off. The littlest things make me feel like my world is ending. And also at the same time, like I get super hyper all the time for over nothing, which honestly is my personality if you know me, but it makes sense with what's going on with me. Part of me was excited, but more of me was embarrassed and more of me was like, I don't wanna tell anyone. I don't wanna tell my family because one, like none of them are gonna be surprised. And which was funny because everyone, when I started being like, okay with it and wanting to share more, um, I, everyone was like, yeah, it's a, like, it's about time you found out. And like, I was so taken back. I'm like, oh, bipolar, how did I, how, not me. And everyone's like, mm, makes a lot of sense. So I don't know where like, I lost the memo or didn't get the memo, but apparently this was obvious. Kidding, it was. Um, but no, but, but, but once I got diagnosed and I finally accepted it, um, it, I just, I felt so much better. I felt like I, I don't have to explain myself anymore. I don't have to constantly think about, you know, is something else wrong? Is something else more? Because we know what it is now and now I can manage it. And um, no, not every day is good. I still have some bad days, but it's nowhere near as bad. One, because I'm self-aware and two, I'm staying on top of my medication. <laughs> but I also think that's part of being bipolar type two. If you are familiar with bipolar type one and bipolar type two, which I was not, and I'm still, I still could get this wrong. So bipolar type one, there's, there's mania episodes and there's like depressive episodes. So mania is when you're, it's like life feels so incredible and you're on top of the world. And there's normally very impulsive behaviors, um, like to the point where it's like, you're buying things that, um, you really cannot afford, like just charging it to your credit card. And you're like, Oh, like I'll deal with it later. Like very, very like off the whim things. And you don't see that you don't see how that that's not a reasonable thing. Um, I guess it's to the point, the mania episodes are to the point where sometimes you have to be hospitalized, you're on such a high, um, as well as the depressive episodes, you're on such a low that you need to be hospitalized. That's what I've been, that's what I've been reading, okay? Now, from my experience of bipolar type two and from what I've read and the way I've been able to piece it together, um, it's like that, but it's way downscaled. So yes, I'm still very impulsive. If you know me, like I'll be like, mm, I want some cookies and 
Next thing you know, I've ordered Insomnia or Crumble to my Crumble fans. Crumble, if you're watching this, sponsor me. Okay. Just very impulsive. Like I don't take the time to think things through. If like I want something, I'm gonna go get it, which is like, part of me is like, no, like I'm just a go-getter. And it's like, no, you're just bipolar. I'm trying to make it humorous, you know? Cause that's, that's my cup of tea is like making trauma humorous or just, I cope with humor. So deal with me. I don't mean to be offensive. It's just who I am. Anyway, you have this impulsive behavior. Um, and then you have, so it, but it's called hypomania cause it's not as intense. And then you have depressive episodes. Um, for me, my depressive episodes last way more than my hypomania episodes. And it's actually hard for me to pinpoint when I'm hypomanic because I'm just a goofy person. So I'm not really sure if like, when I'm being really goofy, like if that's a manic episode or not. So I'm still kind of trying to navigate those waters, but it's very obvious when I'm in a depressive mood for sure. But back to my medication. So the lithium that I was taking, um, it was working really well for me. And then we actually decided to increase it um, because I was handling it well. And our goal was to keep moving up and to, to reach a certain point. Um, but that's when my body decided that it wasn't gonna do the job anymore. I actually started breaking out in this really weird rash um it's actually scarred my skin now and i am like i'm not gonna show y'all but i'm like covered in these like white spots now um they're like scars almost um so we stopped that medication which was really really hard because um we wanted to see if this was even causing this reaction or if this was you know something completely unrelated so we stopped taking that for a week which was a very hard week for me emotionally because one, you know, now I'm not taking a medication that I've already adjusted to. So chemically I was all over the place and emotionally I was a hot mess. Um, it felt like I was back to the beginning and like I had never taken medication or been diagnosed. It was crazy. So that's why it's so important to stay on top of your medication um, because it really does do wonders for you. So we moved from lithium, which was a mood stabilizer to an antipsychotic, um, which was called Abilify or which is called Abilify. And that's what I'm on now. Um, and that shift was hard and I was not excited for it because I was nervous about the side effects, which of course I underwent again, back to the nausea and the migraines. Um, but once that subsides, like it's smooth sailing. Doctor, when she wanted to switch from a mood stabilizer and try an antipsychotic, um, she was like, don't be freaked out that it's called an antipsychotic. I'm like, girl, I am not. Like whatever gives me mental clarity, I don't care what it's called, like put me on it. So if you're on an antipsychotic, don't be ashamed. Like. It works, it does its job. Who cares? Who cares what it's called? Who cares? <sighs> so like 40 minutes later, that's my mental health story. And it's still a battle you guys. And I still wake up and I still have hard days, but staying consistent with my medication, talking to my doctor, being honest with myself, um, journaling. I feel like if you know me, if you've been following me, journaling has always been a huge thing for me. My faith is a huge thing for me. Um, and that's a whole separate thing is um, as a believer, um, I used to think that my mental illness or like my depressive episodes were because of my lack of faith. And I think that was the hardest thing for me to deal with, um, especially when I was depressed and having my depressive episodes was I thought, oh, I just haven't had enough faith. So that's why I'm feeling like this. Like I felt like God was punishing me and being able to be on the other side of that and being mentally like chemically balanced and in a place where I have mental clarity um, that is so not the case. That is so not the case. Um, God is a good God. And this is just a battle that I am facing and God is right there with me to fight through it. And it is not a lack of faith. Uh, if anything, it's led me to having stronger faith um, because I've had to lean on him through all of this. Um, but it's really cool to, to be able to flip that perspective and not think that way anymore because I think that was killing me more than anything. But you guys, if you have any questions, you can DM me on um, Instagram. My Instagram is right here. It's at McKen Kelly. Um, seriously, I would love to talk to you guys about this. If you have any questions, if you think you may be dealing with this um, with bipolar or any sort of mental illness, I'd love to be just a listening ear or give any advice that I can. You got this. Thanks for watching.